I wanted to make a podcast jam-packed of just infinite banking, whole life, where we can point people to and say, hey, here's everything you need to know. Infinite banking is literally just taking back the banking function in your life. You put your money in a bank. They take it and invest it. They They lend it to people. They pay you 1%. If they take your money and lend it to me at 5%, they're making a 4% spread. Infinite banking is taking back that function so you can do that. Right now in my life, I've got $30 million worth of debt. On my family, I've got about 40 million because I own policies of my wife, my daughters, just on me, 30 million. When I'm likely to die, the death benefits like 200 million. Welcome back to another episode of the Austin is Zayback show. Today, by popular demand, we are going to be having a conversation with a gentleman that we've had on before by the name of Mr. Burr, a.k.a. Devin Burr. And uh, Devin is somebody who's primarily known for the infinite banking uh, model, right? The whole life, you know, infinite banking model. But we're going to do a deep dive, talk about how he got into that, uh, what led him to to doing that, and and how he's able to been able to scale to you know pretty insane numbers. And we're going to dive into all that. And uh, by the way, if you haven't listened to the first time I had Devin on, make sure you go listen to that. We'll link that down below, uh, or I'll pop it up on your screen. So go check that one out. And uh, Devin, I appreciate you being on again, bro. Dude, it's nice being on. This studio is legit, bro. Yeah, dude. Like the last one we were on, I feel like we were in like a shoebox. <laughs> we this, were. This, yeah, this is definitely a little more, uh, I'm yeah. able to like mm-hmm. chill on this couch, which is incredibly comfortable. So yeah. if I start falling asleep, just throw something It's all good, me. bro. Yeah, we were talking before the show. Devin was like, can I lay down and do the pod? I'm like, we could, you know? Might not get like good short form content out of that. Therapist style. You'll right. Be my therapist. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk through infinite banking. That's exactly right, dude. Um, well, you know, for, for anybody, Devin, who doesn't have any clue what infinite banking is or, or any of that, maybe, I guess, you know, even before that, like kind of just talk to me about like, how did you get into this whole infinite banking thing to begin with? Because at one point you were doing real estate, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I still do real estate. I use infinite banking for real estate. So we'll get into that. But I started off just doing wholesaling flips and I noticed I'm like paying a lot in taxes because of short term capital gains. And I'm like, I want to build more wealth. How do I do that? It's by holding on to properties. So I started doing the Burr method because my last name is Burr. How about I be Mr. Burr? And um, it just stuck. I started doing a lot of those deals and COVID happened. I was getting all my deals from going to local meetups. So local meetups went away. And I'm thinking like, I got to learn something new. I've got to just become more valuable. So I'm in my house listening to podcasts and I heard one about becoming the bank Mm -hmm. and it just all made sense to me. It just clicked. I'm like, this is incredible. I need to learn more about this. So I'm doing all the research. I'm reading all the books. I'm literally up at like two in the morning on my phone, looking at articles. My wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to change our lives. (laughs) Just trust me. Yep. And I feel like I became an expert at the concept before even having a policy to do it with. Mm. So I got a policy in May of 2020. First one ever. First one ever. And I used it for real estate. And I was like, this is incredible. I need more. So I got three more policies by the end of the year. And I'm just using them with all my real estate Mm -hmm. deals, all my bird deals. I was using them for some wholesaling. And... I was like, this is incredible. I need to tell people. So I started telling everybody. And most people, when they think of whole life, they think of, oh, it's it's a scam. It's overpriced insurance. And they didn't know what I knew. I knew about how to have a policy set up for, not for a death benefit, for cash value. Mm -hmm. So I can use it to go multiply money. So every time I told someone about it, they're just like looking at me like, that's not how it works, bro. And I'm like, well, then how am I doing it? Right. And then- I got on social media, um, TikTok, December of 2020. I made a couple videos. My third one like went viral about me just talking about infinite banking, how I'm using it to buy cars. And I'm like, I think I'm on to something. Let me just mm-hmm. keep talking about this. Within probably two months. So yeah, by like February, I had 250,000 followers on TikTok. Wow. All organic. And now everyone's starting to ask me for policies. They're like, how can I get one? How can I get one? I'm like, Go to this guy. I would <laughs> yeah. just send him to the person I got it from. Didn't even think about monetizing mm-hmm. it. And after about two weeks sending him hundreds of pieces of business, yeah. I'm like, this is really stupid. How about I just be him and set it up? Mm-hmm. So I got licensed March of 2021. 
Since then, I've set up over 3,000 policies. Wow. All organic from social media. Dang. Crazy. Dude, it's on another level, bro. We got a lot to talk about today, Devin. You know, we're going to have a phenomenal podcast. <clears throat> if you've ever thought about getting into infinite banking whole life, you know, uh, make sure you stay to the end of the podcast because I'm going to ask Devin. We're going to go deep. We're going to deep dive on the entire thing. So, you know, for somebody, Devin, that has zero clue what <clears throat> any of this even is, like, just talk to me like I'm an idiot. Like, what is infinite banking? What's whole life? All right. So, infinite banking is literally just taking back the banking function in your life. Think about what you do with banking functions. You put your money in a bank, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you need that money, you go use it to pay your bills, to go do a real estate investment, to buy things for this studio, right? Mm -hmm. But first, what does your money do? It goes into a bank. What does a bank do with that money? They yeah. take it and invest it. They, they it lend out. it to people. So all they're doing is they're paying you to keep your money there. Mm -hmm. They're lending it and making a spread. So if they pay you, the average is 0.06%. But let's just say for easy math, they pay you 1%. If they take your money and lend it to me, let's say at 5%, they're making a 4% spread. Mm -hmm. So they're actually turning 1% into 5. That's a 400% cash on cash return using your money. Yep. Right? Yep. That's what banks do. So infinite banking is taking back that function so you can do that. All you do is you change where your money goes first. Instead of it going into their bank, so Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, you put it into your policy and treat your policy as a banking system. Mm. So it goes there. Now it's guaranteed to compound and grow at at least three and a quarter. Remember, banks are 0 0.06. Yeah. So it's already growing way more than in the normal bank, right? Now you take it and you do exactly what they do. You turn a loan into an asset. You borrow against that money. Mm -hmm. So you're not removing it. You're leaving it in the policy to compound and grow. You're borrowing against it. So you're turning a loan into an asset. You take that loan. If they charge you, let's say 5%, which is what it generally is. And you can take it and go make 10% by lending it. Private mm -hmm. lending is an easy example. You're making a 5% spread. Got it. See what I'm saying? Yep. The whole time, your money is compounding and growing inside of a contract in whole life that is guaranteed to grow tax-free. Wow. So you're making money as the bank by making a spread. You're also making money in the policy. So you're making money in two places at the exact same time. So why, do, why is there, for some people who maybe have had a negative connotation associated with what we're talking about, why do you think that is? Is it just lack of understanding? I think it's, uh, there's a lot, we can get into a lot of stuff of why this is, but before like 1980, mm -hmm. about 80 to 85% of Americans had whole life insurance. After that point, now it's about 35%. What happened? Think about what came around around that time is 401ks, getting into the stock market, all these things that are pushed by financial advisors, financial advisors push products that pay them a commission. Mm -hmm. Think about any kind of financial advisor. They want you to hold your money for the long term, right? Put it in there steady and hold it for the long term, right? Yep. So they get paid on money under management. So of course, that entire industry of financial advisors wants you to put as much money into products mm -hmm. and leave it there long term. Ride the stock market and hope and pray it's going to be enough when you retire. Prior to that time though, People used whole life insurance, the Rockefellers. Mm. Everyone knows the Rockefellers. Yep. They've been wealthier and wealthier and wealthier over nine generations because they use whole life insurance, a guaranteed place that's going to compound and grow. And then you can use it tax free with loans while it continues to grow. And then when you pass away, everyone dies. It's guaranteed to happen. Yep. You get a ben death benefit to your family tax free. So that's one of the reasons is like, everything kind of switched over to 401ks and all these things that were brought about. So financial advisors push those things. They don't push whole life. You mm -hmm. always hear, um, buy term and invest the difference, right? Mm -hmm. It's the stupidest thing ever. Cause here's the thing. Term insurance is the most expensive product. People always think it's the cheapest. It's the most expensive. You're 29, right? Yep. If you got a term insurance for 20 years, the likelihood you're going to die in the next 20 years is very slim. Mm-hmm. 
or the insurance company wouldn't insure you, right? Sure. Yep. So they know you're probably not going to die. You're going to pay a small amount for 20 years every month. You're going to outlive that to get that same coverage when you're now 49. Mm -hmm. It's probably 10 times as much. Yeah. From 49 to 69, you're more likely to die. Mm -hmm. Still not super likely, but let's say you do get the same insurance for the next 20 years. When you're 69, it's probably 30 times more than what it started at at 29. Wow. Now you can't even afford getting it. When are you likely to die? During that time frame. Mm -hmm. But for 40 years, you paid into an insurance policy that didn't pay out. Term insurance only pays out 1.1% of the time. Wow. 1.1. So why, why wouldn't everybody just do, you know, and just maybe like, again, like I'm a fifth grader, right? Like when you're looking at term and then you're looking at whole life, those are different things. Correct me if I'm wrong. Right. Okay. So why not? Cause you still get a death benefit when you go, when you do the whole life, like what you're doing with the infinite banking model. Right. Mm -hmm. And you get other benefits too, which is that you get to use your money you or you can borrow against it, blah, blah, blah. Right. So then why would anybody just get just basic old term? Like why? Like they just don't know any better. Cause that's, what's pushed. Think about what the insurance comp what the insurance company is doing is they're pushing the most profitable products, mm -hmm. right? That's what any company should do. They're going to push their profitable stuff. If a policy only has to be paid out on a death benefit 1% of the time, that means 99% of the time they're going to collect all those payments. So mm -hmm. they're pushing that. Everyone's pushing term insurance because it's the most profitable. Yep. Right. They're not pushing whole life because it's not as profitable. And most people don't know how to structure it to where it's for living benefits opposed to a death benefit. Cause it is called life insurance, not death insurance. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. It just needs to be structured correctly. If you go to like your broke ass brother in law, <laughs> he's going to sell you a regular whole life insurance policy, which is built for the death benefit, mm -hmm. which pays a lot of commission. What we do is we lower the death benefit, lower the commission, and have you overfund it. When you overfund it, you're getting instant cash value. Mm. And there's like 0.25% commissions on that. So the agents paid very, very little on overfunding. So we're lowering our commissions so that you as the client get a whole bunch of cash value that you can use to become the bank. Sure. Yeah. When, when you do that, when you structure it that way, right? Um, do, you know, how does it work in terms of, you still get a death benefit, correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong. So is it just le a lesser death benefit <clears throat> because, and then you're taking advantage of it while you're alive? How does that work exactly? Like when you just do the death benefit one, like where you're talking, if you went to your brother-in-law, right? Is it just that that one just gives you more of a death benefit, but then you just don't get really anything while you're alive? Great question. So a regular whole life, like everyone thinks about, is there's two parts to a contract. There's a base premium. That's what regular whole life is. That pays for the death benefit. Mm -hmm. That doesn't create any cash value for several years. So that's what most people think when they think about whole life. It's a bad place to put money because you're not able to use it for several years. Yep. Regular whole life. Then there's PUAs, paid up additions. That's you overfunding that base, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's purely base, 100% base, the death benefit is higher. You just can't use any of what you're putting in for several years. Got it. With what we do, we're lowering the base, so lowering our commissions, lowering the death benefit, and then we're putting the PUAs on top. That gets you the instant cash value, very little commission. And it also buys a little bit of death benefit. So what happens in these kind of policies is the death benefit starts low. Mm -hmm. But since you're always overfunding, the death benefit grows over time. Mm. So for instance, right now on my life, I've got uh, like $30 million worth of death benefit. On my family, I've got about $40 because I own policies of my wife, my daughters. Mm -hmm my parents, just on me, 30 million. When I'm likely to die, 80, 90 years old, the death benefits like 200 million. Wow. So it's like, I get to use the money now, but it's also growing the death benefit over time. So when I'm likely to die, I could use all this money, but my family's going to get even more when I die. Sure. Unless I was to die tomorrow, then they're going to get less because the death benefit was built low. They would get 30, right? 
they'd still get 30. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I think they'll be fine. Yeah, they'll be good. Yeah. Um, I want to talk because you brought them up. I want to talk about like the Rockefellers, right? Mm-hmm. You you mentioned that. Um, so is that so they've they've actually been doing this for nine generations because I don't think I knew that. Mm-hmm. Yep. So are they known for whole life? Like this is what they're known for then. They're not known for it. Like the Rockefeller. Like but John- like when people think about their wealth and how they're fit. Because when you, I guess, let me, let me preface it. So like when we think about normal wealthy people, right? Like we always hear the, the, the horror stories of, um, you know, you go bust your ass. You make a lot of money. You, you sell a company. You make a couple billion dollars. And then you die and your kids blow it. It lasts like one generation on average. Right. Like you always hear about that, right? Like where um, like money doesn't really last like multiple generations. Like typically, I think it literally statistically is like the next generation will burn through the whole thing, right? So how in the world did the Rockefellers structure <clears throat> everything to where that didn't happen? So great question. There's a book that uh, I'm rereading right now because I'm having the author on my podcast. His name's Garrett Gunderson. His book is What Would the Rockefellers Do? Mm. Great book. Wow. So anyone who wants to to learn more about this, definitely suggest reading that book. But there were two families back then, the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts. Okay. Okay. The Vanderbilts actually had more wealth than the Rockefellers. Okay. So it was John D. Rockefeller and uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Okay. The Vanderbilts, they're broke right now. Really? They were all broke within, I think, two generations, two or three. Okay. Reason being is one, John D. Rockefeller started setting up whole life insurance policies that, again, are guaranteed to grow. So he's putting all of his wealth into those. Mm -hmm. They're compounding and growing tax free. You can use the money for whatever you want without interrupting that. Then he's going to die at some point. He knows this. When he dies, all that death benefit, he structured it to go into a trust. Mm. So this is very important. The trust is the beneficiary of the death benefit. So when millions upon millions, in his case, probably billions and billions of dollars, went into a trust. Now you just have to set up a succession plan so that trust dictates what the money goes to. Mm. That's all a trust really is. It's it's like a a roadmap of how you want money spent when you're gone. Got it. Okay. Because the Vanderbilts didn't do that. So all the money just went to the heirs. And the heirs are like, all right, cool. Let's start buying (laughs) all these. How many Vanderbilt, you guys can look this up. I think it's like five or six Vanderbilt mansions were built. Wow. I think only one of them stands as of today. Mm -hmm. So they were just trust fund babies buying a bunch of stupid stuff, right? But John D. Rockefeller, he set up the trust so that way when all that money goes in, it has to go on to new policies. Mm. So think about what's happening. It's genius. Just most people don't do this much planning. Everything grows tax-free inside of a policy. When you die, the death benefit is paid tax-free to a trust, okay? If that trust, the succession plan is to pay on new policies that are built the same way, you can use the money right away, on other people in the family, it grows tax-free. And then when they die, it goes back to the trust, tax-free. It buys more policies on their kids. Mm -hmm. That grows tax-free. So literally, if you just do a little planning and you have a little knowledge, your family can become wealthier and wealthier and wealthier without paying taxes. Wow. Yeah. Income tax. There is a a state tax, but there's no income tax. With the kids in that scenario with with Rockefeller, do they get any, like in your opinion, maybe you don't know this, right? Maybe nobody does. But the way that he wrote that succession plan, or maybe the way that you would write it, let's just say hypothetically, would it be like, give 10% of this death benefit to the kids, but put 90% back in? Or would you just put 100% back into new policies and then and then what? They just are able to leverage the money yep. if they want, but then at 5% interest or whatever? Exactly. So you want a succession plan where that money is, it's guaranteed to be protected. Mm-hmm. So like my kids, when I pass away, they can't just go take a bunch of money out and go to Vegas, right? They can do a policy loan from the new policies that the money went into to, let's say if they want to buy a car, right? They can take it, but they have to pay that car payment back to themselves. Yeah. If they buy a car from a regular bank, again, it's all about taking back the banking function. Mm -hmm. When we go buy cars nowadays, we finance them through banks. 
So if we pay a bank, let's say current rates as of this recording are probably about seven, eight percent on a car. If not more right now. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. let's just say, let's say nine. Yep. If you take out a car loan and you pay the bank back 9% for five, six years without fail, because you don't want your credit to go bad and you don't want them to take the car, <laughs> right? Shouldn't you pay yourself back that same amount? Mm -hmm. 9%. So you're actually keeping more of the money that you give away if you use your policy as a banking system. Because mm -hmm. instead of borrowing from a bank and giving them 9% every single month without fail, you're just paying yourself back what you would have paid them. Right. You're keeping that 9%. And if you keep that and never stops growing, over time you get a lot of money. Compound interest just takes time. Yeah, for sure. It's pretty crazy that you set up your first policy May of 2020. We're recording August of 2024. So what, four and a half years, give or take? Not even. And you have 30 million in death benefit. You have a total of 17 <clears throat> policies. How many total policies between you and your family? 15. 15. Okay. It's pretty wild. It's insane, dude. It's pretty wild. So you're telling me that in, in the year 2020, did you pull any money out in 2020? I didn't pull money out. Remember, okay. there's, there's two things you can do. You can put money in and you can withdraw it. Yep. Then you're, it's no longer compounding and growing. And you can withdraw it up to your cost basis. So how much you've put in with zero taxes. So like, let's say you put in a hundred grand and you've got 150 grand in cash value. If you pull out a hundred grand, there's no taxes. Once you start pulling out that other amount that's grown, you'll get taxed on. Got it. That's one option. The second option is to borrow against it. So then you're never removing it from the compound interest. Mm -hmm. You never want to interrupt compound interest. Right. Ever. Like everyone's probably heard of the, the penny that doubles in 30 days. Mm -hmm. It takes till day 28 to get over a million bucks, but by day 30, it's over 5 million bucks. Yeah. But if you interrupt that penny any time in that, it's going to take a lot longer to get to that million. Mm -hmm. So you never want to interrupt compound interest. You always want to borrow against a policy. You were telling me on the phone the other day, I was talking to you about it. You're like, look, you know, the, the, the best thing that you can do that anybody watching can do that I can do is to to learn about this the younger you are the better right because of what you just said right right like sure if you're 40 watching this you can go set up a, a everything that we're talking about right but if you're 25 and watching this or you're 22 and watching this like you could be in a really good place towards the end of your life can you talk to me a little bit about why that is it's just compound interest. Yeah. Like it just takes time. So for instance, my wife is eight years younger than me. And my first policy was on me. The second policy I got on her. So they're about the same amount, dollar amount. By the time she's like 60 and when I'm 60, the cash value is night and day. She has so much more because it's had longer to grow, mm. right? Because mm -hmm. she's further away from 60 than I am. Okay. So it just has eight more years to compound and compound interest is kind of like a, like a hockey stick. Mm -hmm. Doesn't do much, doesn't do much. And then boom, it just goes up exponentially. So it just takes time and the younger you are, the better. So I always urge my clients, if you have kids, get them policies right away. I have a, a newborn daughter. She's eight months old. She had a policy the second she had a social security number. Wow. So she was two weeks old and had yeah. a policy for 10 grand a year. By the time she is, uh, I can put 10 grand a year in for 21 years, mm -hmm. and then I can only put in five. So that's, again, the base versus PUA. The base is five. The PUAs are five. I can only put that in for so long without it being taxable. Mm -hmm. So after 21 years, I can only put in five now. But by the time she's 21, I've put in 210 grand. Her cash value is like 400 and something grand. Yep. And I can use all that money anytime because I'm the owner. So I can use it, I can go invest it, I can go make more money with it, all while it's going to keep compounding and growing like I never touched it. And then when she's 18, if I feel like she can use it as a banking system and be responsible, I can assign it to her as the owner. Got it. And now she puts a dollar in, it's pumping out $2, $3. By the time she's my age, she puts a dollar in, it's pumping out 6 or $7. So it's like one of the best things you can do for your kids, the younger they are. So then I would assume 
to put a policy on somebody else, you don't actually need like their, how, how does that work? Right? Like, do you have to be related to them? Like, can I just go put a policy on some guy I just met? I mean, how does it work? Definitely can't do that. Okay. You have to have what's called an insurable interest. Got it. So you can insure anybody that you want to see live for a long time. So a spouse, mm -hmm. you could insure them. Like you and Mo are um, engaged, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You could insure Mo. Um, you can insure kids. You could insure uh, mom and dad. You can insure aunts and uncles. You could insure business partners. Really? Um, yeah. So wow. you, you can insure business partners. How does that work? So you basically... Do you even need their permission? You need their permission. But you didn't get your daughter's permission, I can't imagine. That's the great thing is if they're she's minors... She's when you did. <laughs> if they're minors, you don't need their permission. Got it. So my oldest daughter, she is uh, 17 this year, okay. which is crazy. And she already has three policies. And you didn't need a permission because she's not 18. Okay. So, so in America, 18 is the cutoff then. Yep. Okay. As soon as they're 18, you have to have the permission. Okay. But again, if it's done correctly, my daughter's never going to say, nope, you can't get a policy on me because she knows what it's for. Right. Like, for instance, she bought a car, her first car at 16, from one of her policies. It was a $30,000 car. So we had $30,000 in cash value in this policy that's in her name. Mm-hmm. So she's the insured person. I'm the owner. Yep. We take the cash value alone, buy the car, cash. And now again, all we do is we treat our money like the banks. Mm -hmm. What was the payment going to be on that car? It was 446 bucks a month for six years. Yep. So we just take that 446, pay it back to her policy. So it's building back up in there and she's paying it. So she has a job. She pays that 446. Got it. So it's going into a place she can reuse again. She's got like 3,100 bucks built back up. And she was like, tell me for Christmas, she wants to wrap the car. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, well, if you want to wrap the car, you can take a loan from your policy, but you've got to pay yourself back with interest. Mm -hmm. So why would she never want more of that, that banking system in her name? Sure. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. So, so the business partner thing, I mean, you just need their permission and yep. you can do it. And there's no other, when you say insurable interest, is that what you said? Yep. How do you prove that? Right. I mean, like, I guess anybody that is close to you, mm -hmm. you would assume any, any person in the right mind would assume like you'd want that person to live a long time. So is that just kind of how they, they look at it? Yeah. They'll look at it like immediate family. So kids, that's an insurable interest. You want your kids to live a long time. Yeah. Right. Your spouse, you want them to live a long time. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> if you're married to the right person, yeah. right? Yep. Um, so those people, they don't ask too many questions. Again, the other person just has to agree if they're over 18, okay. right? Um, when you start looking at brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, they'll, they'll dig a little deeper. Because um, insurance companies, basically all they do is they assess risk, Yeah. right? How risky is it to get a policy on this person? When do we think we'll have to pay this death benefit? Because that's what whole life is. It is a guaranteed death benefit mm -hmm. for your whole life. They know they're going to have to pay it. But if you're 29, if they underwrite you, they're probably thinking, this guy's not going to die until he's probably 80, 90 years old. We got a long time to take his premiums and go make more money so we can afford to pay this death benefit. Mm -hmm. Right? But if they do a medical exam on you and, God forbid, you've got some sort of terminal illness, they're not going to insure you because they, they know you're probably going to die quicker. They're going to have to pay out this death benefit. Yeah. They're just assessing a risk. That's it. So when it comes to who you're insuring, if it's a business partner, there's more risk. So they're going to really dig into the business. Why is there more risk? Because think about it. If, if you have a business partner, yeah. right, you guys could be in business together for a couple months. Yeah. You might have just met. Like, do you really want them to live a long time? Right. You, is... 10, 15, 20 mil of a death benefit more important than him. That's mm. the way they look at it. Yeah. They just look at the risk factor. But if you guys have been in business for 10 years, he's a vital piece of the business. Without his visionary skills, his integrator skills, whatever it might be, if he's gone, the business fails. They look at that. They dig into those things. And if they, if they assess that risk and say, there's not a lot of risk for him insuring this person, this person is vital to that business that is their main bread earner. Yeah, let's have him insure him. Wow. Because if he was to pass away, you're going to have all that death benefit. That kind of, it's putting his, his 
human life value in a dollar form. Mm -hmm. If he is gone, he or she is gone and can no longer be the business partner, the business takes a dive, that death benefit just made you whole. Yeah. Right? Sure. So they just assess risk. That's yeah. it. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, and then, and then when you, when you talk about like the insurance company, right? So then they're going to go, the only way that you, and you said it a minute ago that, that, that they can even, that these insurance companies can even be in business and do what they do is if they make money, they have to make money. They have to be profitable. Right. right? So they have to be right. 51% of the time or more, you know, um, where do they invest the money? Like when you look at like, okay, like if they're guaranteeing you, I think you said three and a quarter mm -hmm. is like the guaranteed, right? Yep. Annual return. Then they have to go make, you know, what, five, six percent to, to be profitable over a long period of time, because that very arbitrage that they're creating is the death benefits that they're paying. Like some of it, right? Like it has to be because that's how they can afford to eventually pay all the death benefit, right? Well, see what it is, and, and people get this wrong a lot. They think in a whole life, another reason it's a scam, people say, is because, well, when you die, your family gets the death benefit. They don't get the cash value as well. People don't understand what it is. The cash value is slowly growing into the death benefit over time by three and a quarter percent. Mm -hmm. That's it. So if, if you put in $100,000, let's say, and your death benefit's $10 million, and you die the next day, they have to pay 10 million, but they only had a hundred grand, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So the longer you live, the more you put in a hundred grand, they can go invest it. What they do is they invest it in super, super conservative things, long-term treasury bonds, mm -hmm. things that don't fluctuate a ton because they're playing the long game. They're thinking that you're going to live for a long time, right? So they'll, they'll lend blocks of money to banks. Banks will pay them five, 6%. Mm -hmm. They'll, they'll do real estate deals. They'll JV stuff. They'll lend to you as a um, policy yeah. holder. Here's the crazy part. And this is in the contract. This is why I love policies because they're unhindered control. You have full control over the money because in the contract, you as a policy holder getting a policy loan supersede any other investment they can make. Really? Any investment. So they, they almost can't deny you. They cannot deny you. Interesting you supersede any investment. So if they have no money, which they always have money coming in because people are paying premiums, but let's say they've got no money in their general account because it's all lent out. It's all into something else. They have to sell that stuff to give you a policy loan. They have to. So you have total control. Wow. And here's the beauty is, if you take a policy loan, most people think of loans as like, I have to make a payment, right? Mm -hmm. So if I go get a loan on some, I've got a structured payment I have to make with interest every single month with a policy loan. It's an unstructured loan. You don't have to make a payment because here's the thing. The insurance company knows you're going to die. They right. just don't know when. So they charge you interest, but if you never pay it, they'll just deduct it from your death benefit. Mm. So it's the least risky loan for them. They're going to get their money back whether you pay it tomorrow yep. or you don't pay it and they just don't have to pay the death benefit to your family because they deduct the amount. Right. Mm -hmm. So they'll lend to you all day long. They have to via the contract. It states it, you supersede anyone else. So you have unhindered control of that actual money and you never have to pay it back. So you decide whether or not you pay it back. You have total control. You never have to have a credit check. You never have to, um, that's this, what I was going to ask you. Like, let's say your credit score is 350. Doesn't matter. And you just file bankruptcy, but you've got a million bucks in cash value because you've been paying in mm -hmm. for a decade, you know, and, and doesn't matter. But you're freaking, you know, you just file bankruptcy, 300 credit score, the whole thing. You, they have to give you the loan. Have to. And, yeah. and, and arguably they have to give you the loan at, at what, what did you say? The average is like 5%. Right. They're playing the long game. So th mm -hmm. their rates don't change a lot. Like we see rates changing with the housing market and cars and all this stuff. They generally are right around 5%. They'll change 0. 0.2. Have 0. you seen 1. them? What's the highest you've ever seen? Uh, 5.6. Okay. And the lowest I've seen is like 4.7. Yeah. So they're right around that 5%. Um, but yeah, like they have to give you the loan and they do not check your credit. They don't report it to anything. So think about this. Like if you've got a million dollars out in policy loans, 
it's not going to hinder you from getting approved for a mortgage or whatever because it does not show up on your credit because there's no payment to show. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. You're just leveraging your death benefit while you're alive. You're borrowing from that and using your cash as collateral to get that loan. Make sense? Total, totally, totally. So let's run a scenario. You know, um, we ran a scenario on the phone the other day. Now, obviously, I know you don't have your your computer in front of you. You can't give me a, a beautiful PDF for everybody Break, watching, let's go right? Get it. Um, but just a hypothetical, okay? So how does it work if if I'm watching right now or somebody's watching and or if I'm wanna do this, you know, uh, but I really want to ask you these questions for everybody else. How do I decide? how much money to start with? Like, how do I decide what I'm going to pay in? Like, do you decide? Does the insurance company decide? Who decides? So the person always decides. So if we're talking on the phone, you're like, how much should I put in? I'd be like, how much can you put in? How much do you want to put in? You would always decide. So as the agent, um, we never tell our clients how much to put in. Got it. Um, but I would tell you is that one of the best books I've ever read is Richest Man in Babylon. It talks about one of the keys to wealth is saving at least 10% of every dollar made. Mm. So every dollar you have, at least 10% should go to savings. At its core, that's all whole life is. It's a savings vehicle. It's a savings vehicle that gives you extra benefits. That's it. Yep. It's a place to store your capital and then use it when you need it. So I always tell people like at least 10% of whatever you make. Whatever you make. Okay. So if you make a hundred grand, you should be putting at least 10,000 in this. A year. At least. Okay. But here's why people's like mindsets are really off when it comes to this. They think of it as again, a bill. But if you deposit money in the bank, you can go use that money, right? Mm -hmm. Right away. So people think of whole life as a premium. I have to make a payment. They don't think of it, if it's structured correctly, they don't think of it as, hey, I put this money in, but I can instantly use it. Mm -hmm. So they should think of it as a deposit. I'm depositing money into my policy. I can instantly use that deposit to go make more money, to pay off debts, to go buy a car, whatever it might be, right? And here's what I always tell people is like right now, easy math. Let's say you make $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. After taxes, it's probably about 70, mm -hmm. right? Where does that 70 grand go? To live. Before you do anything with it, where does it go? In the bank. <laughs> Everyone's money flows to the bank because yeah. that's what we've been taught. Mm -hmm. But think about the bank. The bank is paying you 0.06%. It's not protected against losses well, right and now, judgments. Right now, people are making a little bit more, right? Right At the time of making the video. In a high yield savings, yes. Yeah. And but I'm talking about just a check. Just account, a normal. Okay, got it. Where the yep. money usually flows. Yep. 70 grand. It's 0.06%. It's not protected against any lawsuits or judgments. So if you get sued and you got 70 grand sitting in your account, it can be gone the next day. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. It's liquid, which is good. But you, if you take that money out, you stop earning that 0.06%. Mm -hmm. So all I try to get people's mindsets to frame around is like, it's just a different place to flow my money. Mm. If I have 70 grand flow into the bank, why wouldn't I just flow it to my bank? where it pays me a heck of a lot more, mm -hmm. three and a quarter guaranteed plus dividends, it's protected against lawsuits and judgments. So if I've got all this money sitting here and someone tries to sue me, they cannot touch it. Interesting. I don't think I knew that. Creditor protected wow. in most states. I think it's 47 states. Okay. Arizona is definitely one of them. Cool. So if you put money in here, they cannot touch it. Nobody can touch it. It's not reported to the, the, to the U.S. government. It's a private contract. Okay. You can use it right away. It's liquid, just like the bank. It's a deposit. Again, here's the benefit, though. You can use it without interrupting that three and a quarter plus dividends. Mm. So it's, it's just a better place for your money to flow. And then, oh, by the way, you're going to die someday. Yep. When that happens, this pays a multiple of what you've injected into it. Your bank account, where everyone flows their money, doesn't pay anything. Mm. If you've got 20 grand in the bank when you die, your family... It'll probably go through pro eight. Yeah, you, and you might not even, they might not even get the 20 grand. Yeah. So yeah. it's just a better place for your money to flow. It's a better place for your money to be stored because it can't be touched. And it's a better place to, to make your money more efficient. Mm -hmm. You're going to use money throughout your life. If it's here first, not indefinitely, just first. If it goes here first, it's going to compound and grow guaranteed 
for the rest of your life tax-free, mm. even if you use it. Got it. It's a better place for your money to go. It's a better place for your money to be stored. And it's a better place to use your money to make it more efficient. Mm -hmm. Back to what we were talking about real quick. So, you know, if I'm making, let's just say somebody watching is making 500 grand a year, okay? I mean, I know you say you don't tell people what to do, obviously, but let's just say they're like, I want to do 20% of 500 grand, which would be what, 100 grand, mm -hmm. right? You said that it's all, a lot of it revolves around how we set the policy up. So then based on that math, right? 500 grand, I'm going to take 20% of my income, put it in, in my policy, okay? Do I tell them I'm putting in 100 grand, like as that base that you were talking about a little while ago, or do I tell them Ooh. 50 and then do 50 in the, the PUA, you said? So our team would know how to set it up. Okay. You would just say, I can put in a hundred grand. We would know that the base is probably going to be about 30%. This is again, to keep it untaxed. Yep. Like you could make the base five and the PUA is 95, but it'll become taxable. Got it. So why would you do that? Right. So base about 30%. Why would it become taxable? Sorry. I just have to. So this is the MEC seven payroll. This came about in 1988. So basically again, this is again, remember yeah. before the eighties, 85% of Americans had whole life. Mm -hmm. John D. Rockefeller, all these rock, um, wealthy families would put millions and millions and millions of dollars in a policy. They would get a really small death benefit and they put millions of bucks inside of it to have it protected against lawsuits and judgments and have it grow at a guaranteed rate plus dividends. Back in the 80s, dividends were like 14%. Yeah. So if you can just put all kinds of money on this little baby death benefit, why wouldn't you do that? Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. So the IRS stepped in and just put these rules in place. It's the MEC 7 payrolls. You can only put so much money on top of a death benefit. Okay. So the death benefit, if it's too low and you're putting in too much, it breaks those MEC 7 payrolls and it becomes taxable. Mm. So the agent just has to know how to structure it to kind of hug up against that MEC line without going over. Got it. So we know how to do that. And... That's the most important thing. You, you don't want it to be taxable because taxes are probably the biggest eroder of wealth. Mm -hmm. Hands oh, for down. Sure. Hands down. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, dude, totally separate conversation. So we won't get derailed, but I'm on a mission to, to never pay taxes ever again. I love it. Like I'm on that. It's my goal. I told Moje, I said, we're, I'm not going to ever pay him a dollar. I, I said, I'm, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I'm going to go. If I got to talk to my accountant, if I got to meet with him every month and sit down with him, January through December to, to figure out what in the hell do I have to do? What do I need to buy? Tell me what I got to do. Tell me what cost segregation study I've got to do. What car? Just tell me. But I, I, whatever amount of net income I'm showing on paper, I want that damn number to be zero. You know, because I paid him way too much money. So anyways, you can tell I'm passionate about that. Dude, taxes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, like, I've saved a lot of money on taxes by yeah. knowing some of these loopholes. Um, the tax code is... 98% of how to pay yeah. less taxes. And it's 90,000 pages long. Right. Something like that. So there's only a few pages of here's how you pay taxes. Mm -hmm. The rest is just incentives to pay less. Yep. Right. For instance, if you have a, a car over 6,000 pounds, right, you can write off the car. Mm -hmm. um, cost segregation studies yep. where you can dep bonus depreciation on the house. Um, to make sure that you pay no taxes year one. Mm -hmm. So there's all these things that people just don't know about because they don't study the tax code. Yep. I don't study the tax code, but I've got a tax attorney that does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I For mean? For sure. So, dude, paying less taxes is huge. It's the biggest eroder of wealth. It's literally a scam. Yeah. I believe that taxes are a scam. 100%. If you make a hundred grand, you pay thirty thousand in taxes. Where's that money going, dude? To to freaking North Korea, probably. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, like, let's just be honest. Like the the people, it doesn't matter. In my opinion, it doesn't matter if you're white, if you're blue, if you're red. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican. I mean, truly, when you look at the government, they're terrible stewards of money. Horrible. It doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't really matter what you believe in. You, I mean, if you're just being honest and you look at thirty eight trillion in debt, we printed eighty percent. I read. We printed 80% of the U.S.'s money supply since 2020. So that, just think about that for a minute. I mean, you know, 80% of the money supply in circulation we printed in the last four years. Yeah. 
It's so they're, insane. they're terrible, right? So they're just inflate. They're they're deflating the 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 actual the value of the dollar, mm-hmm. and of course, therefore, causing inflation. So, anyways, yeah, I, I'm with you, man. I, I paid a lot of money in taxes. I'm never going to do that again. Stupid question. Um, when I back to my scenario, okay, five hundred grand, hundred grand in the policy, roughly thirty percent as the base. Your your people are going to set it up. Is that money tax deductible that I'm putting in, or no? Like if I put a hundred grand into my policy, right? Is there any write off on the front end of that for me? Like when it comes to my my earned income for that calendar year? Great question. Um, I'm gonna hit that, but I just want to touch on what you <laughs> said before. Um, with the the money being printed, right? That's causing inflation because it's putting more uh dollar bills in circulation, devaluing each one, right? Mm-hmm. That's only part of the equation. There's fractional reserve lending, mm-hmm. which is a bigger problem. Most people don't really understand this. If you put $1,000 in the bank, the bank only has to keep 100 bucks on deposit. Mm-hmm. So they can lend out 900 What they've done, you're still in the ledger for $1,000. they have lent out 900 They've created 900 bucks out of thin air. Yep. And they do this all the time because where do we store our money? In the bank. Mm-hmm. This is why we've been taught this way, to store our money in the bank so that the banks can go lend it out and it keeps everything flowing by just causing inflation, causing money to be supplied, causing the economy to turn, right? Yep. This is why I put so much money in policies because I don't want to add to the problem. If I keep money in, po- or in uh, banks, I'm adding to the problem because mm-hmm. they can take 90% of it, lend it out, and they don't have to keep my money in there. It's called run on banks. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. If everyone went to the bank right now to get their money, the banks don't have it. They would collapse. So what happened to Silicon Valley. So we saw Silicon Valley Bank and a couple of others, yes. I believe. Yeah. So that's a huge part of the problem with inflation. Everyone always is trying to think like, how do we get this under control, this inflation? It's very simple. Stop putting money in the bank. Mm-hmm. If everyone stopped putting money in banks and put it in properly structured whole life, Whole life insurance policies, they can only lend out what's in the general funds. Mm. They cannot create inflation. Yep. So if everyone stored their money here, guess what would happen to inflation? Yeah. It would go way down, way down. So that's why I store so much in policies. I don't want to add to the problem. Mm-hmm. So that was my tangent. I just wanted I to make it. the point. Um, to your question, uh, is it tax deductible? On the front end. I know it's tax-free on the back end. Yes and no. Okay. 99% of the time, no. There are a few instances where you could get around it um, by using the tax code. So example would be, um, there's a part of the tax code where you can pay your kids, I think it's like just under 13 grand a year Mm -hmm. to work within your business. They don't have to pay taxes on it as income, and I get to write it off as a tax deduction from the business. Mm -hmm. It's literally tax-free money. Yep. Right? So what I do is I employ my daughter to do little things, shred papers, um, you know, send emails, blah, blah, little stuff. Now I'm paying her 12 grand a year. It goes into a policy that Mm. grows tax free. So that's kind of a way you can do it. Sure. Um, But for the most part, you're taxed up front. That's why you're never taxed again. Mm. It's the whole idea of like, would you rather be taxed on a seed or on a harvest? Right. Get taxed on the seed right now. For sure. Let it grow into a harvest and don't pay any taxes on that. Yeah, 100%. Now, it makes all the sense in the world. Um, you know, dude, I mean, I love talking about, I, I feel like I could actually talk about infinite banking for a long time now, you know? Okay, so let's go back to our conversation that we had the other day, just real quick, just so I can wrap my brain around it. So, um, you know, I set this policy up, okay, for anybody watching. And now let's just say my number's 100 grand. Okay, back to my scenario that I gave you. I have to put in though, now what I'm committing to is I've got to put in a hundred grand every year for the rest of my life. How does that work? So what you all you really have to put in is the base. Okay. So if the base is about 30%, you're committing to put in at least 30%, 30, 30 grand a year. Hundred grand, you should put that in because that's over funding it, getting all the cash value. If you just put in 30, you've got a regular whole life. It's not going to create cash value quickly. It'll be defeating the purpose. But here's the cool thing is it gives you flexibility because let's say you can't put in 100 one year. You can do a couple things. You could split it up. Let's say you've only got 50. 
you could split it up from being annual to semi-annual. Mm -hmm. So you could put in 50 now, 50 in another six months. Or if you've only got 25 grand, you could split it up to quarterly, put in 25 now. So you're still over funding because of that 25, 30% is going to the base. Mm -hmm. 70% is going to the PUAs. Mm. Make sense? Yep. Last scenario would be you just put in 30 for the annual amount. But then again, you just have a regular whole life. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, that's only really a factor the first few years. Because the way policies work is the first few years, you don't have access to all your money because there's a cost for insurance, the base premium. Right? Mm -hmm. So eventually, generally year three, you're growth outweighs the base. Mm. So technically you could just use your growth to pay your premiums for the rest of your life. And how would that work if you decided to do that? Like what would that like tangibly, how did, how would you pull that off? Like would you, you, have would to like, call, you would just call them. You just, okay. You, you just call them. Can you like log in somewhere online? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the beauty is you don't have to do anything with the policy. The policy is going to grow regardless. Mm -hmm. If you're smart, you'll let it do that, but also use it to go make more. Mm -hmm. That's what I've done over the last four years, why I've been able to grow it so much, because I don't just put money in and let it do its thing, because it's going to do that regardless if I use it or not. I make sure it's going to do that, and then I use it to go invest into a cannabis company that I just got into, invest into multifamily deals that I'm into, invest into private lending, mm -hmm. invest into flips, whatever I'm doing, I'm making money over here, a lot of it. The money's slowly and steadily going up over here. Mm. So I'm, I'm in year four and my policies are now cranking off money because of how much I've put in. I've got one that I funded a couple months back for 39,000 bucks. I put 39,000 in. It grew by 87. Wow. That's just year four. But the first year, it wasn't like that, right? Mm -hmm. I put in 39. I maybe had access to like 30. So people have to think, are you at a point where you can give up a little liquidity now to have a ridiculous amount later. Yep. Cuz I'm only 39. When I'm 49, 59, when I put 39 into that thing, how much is it going to go up by? Mhm. Mm several hundred thousand. So then all I do is I take that several hundred thousand, go invest to make more and have it always flow back to policy. Sure. But it but the money's still It's never stopping. Gaining. Exactly. Yeah. It never stops growing. It's a contract. And that's the wild guarantee. thing, right? Is that you can borrow against your money and still get paid on your money as if all the money was still there. Right. Right. The best way to explain it, this, whenever I explain it like this, people are like, ah, oh, that makes sense. Because when they think about whole life, it, what I'm saying is not that difficult to understand. It's just, it's, it's so, so counterintuitive, dude. It's so different. Like it's just never taught. Right. Yeah. But most people understand this. If you have a house, when you make a payment on your house, you build equity, mm -hmm. right? You can tap into that equity with like an equity line of credit. So the house is the collateral, right? To get a loan from the bank. Mm -hmm. And you can use the equity. That's the thing you can, you can get the loan for. It's the same thing. Your money you're putting in is the house, the collateral. Mm -hmm. To get a loan of your equity, your cash value, from the insurance company. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. So- to get more equity, you just got to put more in. To get more equity in a house, you got to make more payments, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Or the house has to go up in value, right? What happens with the house or the, the, the collateral in a policy? It always goes up in value. Mm -hmm. So you always can use more equity by just borrowing from the insurance company. See what I'm saying? Totally. So when you think of it like a house, it's the same thing, just different pieces. Mm -hmm. Cash value or I'm sorry, cash you put in is the house, the collateral. Cash value is the equity. And the bank giving you a loan is the insurance company giving you a loan mm. using the collateral to do it. So cool, man. Is there a minimum that you would recommend or there like is. just in general a minimum? In general, your age times 10. Okay. So, so for you, it'd be 290 bucks a month. Got it. However, if you did that, it's going to take quite a while to do anything because mm -hmm. if you put in 290 bucks, you might be able to use 180 right now. What can you do with 180 bucks? Right. So you'd have to let it build up for a while to start using it for anything meaningful. And 290 bucks a month, I mean, it would be like what? 3,600 a year or something like that. A little less. Yeah. yeah. 30, uh, 
four or thirty-five. Yeah, yeah. So it's nothing. You you just can't do much with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could you could do it. It's just not going to do much for a while. Mm-hmm. So I tell people like the minimum for it to really make sense. That's the minimum bare minimum. The minimum for it to really make sense is about ten grand a year. Okay. But again, if you make a hundred, you should be putting ten in anyways. Sure. You've got seventy flow into the bank. Change where it flows. Better place for it to go. Better place for it to be stored. Better place to use the money, and death benefit for your family when you die. Mm-hmm. It is guaranteed to happen. That's one cool thing I love about it, dude. Is like, I've basically purchased my net worth mm-hmm. to an extent. Like, think about if I die tomorrow, my family gets thirty million bucks. Yep. If I had net worth of thirty million, they wouldn't get thirty million. Those things would have to be sold off, right? Mm-hmm. And they'd be taxed. So they don't probably only get like 20. Mm-hmm. So right now I technically would have like a net worth of about 40 million bucks. If I had properties and all this different stuff that added up to 40 million. Cause if I died tomorrow, all that stuff gets mm-hmm. um, sent to them after taxes, they're left with 30 million. I've already purchased $30 million worth of a net worth for them guaranteed mm-hmm. today. Yeah. It's crazy. Insane. And then I use the cash value to go buy more stuff. So when I die, they also get that stuff. Yeah. Like I've got 38 doors right now. So when I pass away, they also get those doors. It's pretty cool, dude. Is there a maximum? Uh, I haven't hit it yet. Okay. It's like $5 million a year. $5 million a year. With one company. You can start in getting different companies to insure you, but I haven't had anyone put in that much. Got it. Most I've had someone put in is like five hundred grand a year. Five hundred grand a year, but five million someone could put in, be just fine per year. Can you imagine how big that thing would be? Dude, you probably have. I mean, if you started that young enough, I mean, if you were twenty five and you put in five million a year, you it would have to be billion. It'd have to be in the billions by the time you, if you died at like seventy five. Remind me uh, later. I'll run an illustration. I yeah. want. I'm actually interested to see now. It has to be, dude. I mean, from because I mean, even just five five million a year times fifty years. Would be two hundred fifty million, right? Yeah, that's not even accounting for all the growth. That's not any growth. That's just ba- that's just like literally the money that you put in in fifty years. So that two fifty has to turn into over a billion. I'm gonna run an illustration over that long of a period of time. That'd be wild, dude. That's my my next goal is to have a policy where I put in five million a year. <laughs> yeah. So okay, I, that leads me to my next question: Can you have an unlimited amount of policies? Yes and no. Um, there's only so much they'll insure one person for. Mm-hmm. So just like you can't overinsure a car, you can't overinsure a body. So it's all based off your net worth, your income. So if if you make a lot of money, you're going to be able to get more insurance on your life than if you don't make a lot of money, mm-hmm. right? So technically there's no real limit because if you use the policies correctly, you take the money to go make more, you're always making more money, so you always qualify for more policies. Mm-hmm. That's why I've got so many of them. And then you can start insuring other people. If you get to the point where they won't give you any more, you can start insuring kids, parents, spouse, aunts and uncles, business partners. Mm-hmm. So there's no real, I know one guy that's got like 70 policies. Really? Yeah. He owns a company up in Canada, Ascendant Financial. His name is Jason Lowe. So he teaches people in Canada how to do the infinite banking concept. Really? 70 policies. Yeah. Wow. So if you guys are in Canada listening to this, hit up Ascendant Financial. Tell them that Mr. Burr sent you. Is it the same in Canada as it is in the U.S.? It's a little, little different. A little Some different. of the rules are a little different. Um, I won't speak too much on it because I'm not licensed there. So yeah. I don't, I don't know for sure, but it's a little different. Yeah. Talk to me about that part just while we're on the subject, like getting licensed and all of that, like to actually sell or write policies mm-hmm. for other people. So you got to go through, um, you have to study for it um, and then take a test and just pass the test with, I think, a 75. Mm-hmm. I took mine three years ago now, so... I'm the worst test taker ever. Dude, I, I'll read something and have no clue what I just read. So I'll have to go back and read it again. I had flashcards, all this stuff. I did not pass the test the first try. Mm-hmm. I missed it by one question. <laughs> and you're in this testing center and like it, it has you wait like a, it seems like like three minutes for it to come up on the screen. It's probably like 30 seconds. But I'm just sitting there. I'm like, oh my God, please have passed. Please have passed. 74. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, no. So I had to retake it. It's for most people, it's easy. I'm just like honestly not the sharpest guy. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I was really good at math in school. Everything else I was horrible at. Mm -hmm. So for most people, it'll probably be easy. For me, it wasn't. Yeah. And you've written 3,000 policies. Yeah, a little over. Between then and now. Was there, has it been pretty consistent the last like four years or has there been kind of like ups and downs in the amount of policies that you've written? Um, yeah, I mean the first couple of years I personally wrote like all of them. Got it. I wanted to talk to everybody. I was just like geeked out on actually talking about it. So I would, I would take like eight hours a day, just back to back to back to back phone calls. There was days where I, I set up like 12 policies in one day. Wow. Um, and it just got to a point where I got burnt out on it. So getting a team in place where agents now take the calls, I bring the leads in from social media. Um, and now they take the calls and I just pay them a little bit of the commission. Mm -hmm. So I haven't written all 3000. Uh, I would say I've probably written a thousand, mm -hmm. but over 3000 have come in because of the content I've put out and that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Is content the only lead generation yep. uh, thing that you do? Yep. So you don't do any like paid. Wow. Yeah, it's 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 kind of like a mental hurdle I need to get over. Uh -huh. uh, just spending money because I've never had to do it. It's all just been organic, and um, I've got a home office. I don't pay for um, an office, and I don't have to pay for a bunch of employees. Like the agents are ten ninety nine. I just break them off a little bit of commission. So like, it's just a hurdle I got to get over, yeah. man. Yeah, you like, gotta was, do it. I was talking to Pineda, and he was Ryan Pineda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out Ryan. Ryan's a solid dude. He, uh, he was like, dude, how about you just like, let me coach you for a year yeah, and I can help you scale the company and do all this stuff. And I'm like, okay. And then he hit me with the price tag. I was like, oh, yeah, I don't know, man. I can't, I, I just, it's a, it's a mental hurdle. I gotta get over For sure, dude. Yeah. I, I get it, man. It, it takes a lot of time to get to a point and, and it's not always the right move. I mean, like you just have to look at it, you know, yeah. which is a whole different conversation. Right. But, um, I think it depends on your goals and you know, you might be at a point where your net income is sufficient for the lifestyle that you want to live and it'll continue to compound. You continue to make more money. Then why, why take on all the headache? Right. You know, like there is something to be said about that too. Um, and I've even thought a lot about that, right? At the level that I'm at, like, dude, the amount of times that I've thought about walking away from everything, moving to Bali, <laughs> getting bought out, you know, from all my companies and just living a simple life, it's right? It'd be easier. Yeah, you think about it all the time. I mean, I've never gotten close to actually doing it, but it's something you think about, of course. I've struggled with it, dude, because I'm, I've got the new daughter. She's eight months old. Um, wifey isn't going back to work, so she's a stay-at-home mom now, and I work from home. I am done working legitimately by about noon. Yeah, every day, and then I go to the gym, and then I get back two o'clock. Let's call it. I'm just spending time with the family. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can do that if I really scaled the business no. and scaled the company, get all these employees. Like I make pretty damn good money and I keep a bunch of it because I'm not putting advertisements out. I'm not buying all this stuff. So it's like, yeah, to your point, like, yeah. do I need more? Mm -hmm. Like once you get a nice car, there's only so many nicer cars you can get, right? Yeah. Once you get a nice house, there's only so many nicer houses you can get until it's gluttony. For sure. Right? Like, my house is pretty nice. Do I need a nicer one? No. No. Like, I actually want a different house because I hate I hate it being upstairs. <laughs> I hate going yeah, upstairs. Two story. Yeah. Dude, I'll go, I, I'll go I, up I don't know there. how you do it. I'll go up there and I'll forget something. So I'll yeah. come back down. I'm like, damn it. You should just get a single story. Yeah. Just it's a it's a wonky time with interest rates. Interest and rates. Election. And yeah. So we've got like uh dude, we can get into this. This is actually interesting. I, I didn't know about this until recently. So we've got a uh, 2875, 30 year fix. Mm -hmm. And my thought process was always like, dude, don't pay an extra penny towards that. Mm -hmm. Super low interest, pay super slow over time. Yep. Right. Because it's 2.875. I didn't look at it as the volume of interest. Mm -hmm. If you run a calculation, and most people know this, if there's a truth in lending disclosure, when you do a mortgage, it shows here's what the balance was. Mm -hmm. Here's what you ended up paying over mm -hmm. 30 yeah. years. It's like double. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the act actual interest rate yeah. isn't 2.875. Mm -hmm. It's actually about 40%. Yep. It was just amortized over a 2.875. Yep. So I learned that you can do uh, like a first lien HELOC. So you pay off your first lien with a HELOC, right? Mm-hmm. 
Now let's say you've got a 9% interest rate. My thought process was always like, why would I want a 9% mm -hmm. when I've got a 2875? And it's because the 9% is simple interest. It's mm -hmm. not amortized. So if you pay 10 grand towards it, you're lowering the amount of interest. Yeah. And guess what? When you pay 10 grand on a HELOC, what can you do again? Mm -hmm. You pull it back out. You can use the money again. Yeah. You pay 10 grand in your house, it's trapped in your two by fours. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at this and I'm like, dude, this could be a really good way to like have money flow better. Cause yeah. I've only got my, my mortgage payments, like 2,800 bucks. I pay 2,800 bucks <laughs> <laughs> for sure. You know what I mean? Yep. But if I had the first lien HELOC, dude, all my extra money would be going to pay down that 9% mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. And then if I needed to use it for something, what's the old saying? Uh, he who has the gold mm -hmm. makes the rules. Yeah. If an opportunity comes up, opportunity finds money. If I've got a whole bunch of money sitting in this HELOC, opportunities are going to find me, right? For sure. But I can't use my house right now for that because of this 2.875. And it dawned yeah. on me. I was like, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I need to get this first thing HELOC. Well, it's the truth, right? Yeah. I mean, like a $500,000 house really costs you like a million bucks, you know, depending on your rate, yeah. right? And even with a low rate, I mean, it's still a $500,000 house probably costs you about eight or nine hundred. That's it's the volume of interest, yeah. not the rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting when you dive into that. Um, I want to talk really quick about, you know, you've made a lot of viral content about buying cars mm -hmm. using infinite banking, right? So talk, tell me about the, tell me the story of the first car that you bought. Because you made content where you're like, look at how I, I think it was like, look at how I bought this Audi R8 for free. Or look at how I got paid. I think you actually took it a step further. You're yeah. Like, look at how I'm getting paid. Yeah. To drive an Audi R8. Tell me that story. So that's actually very controversial because some people are like, "Oh, he's not getting paid. He's just clickbait." Blah blah blah. But if you really take a step back and look at what's happening, I am making money buying the car. Um, the first car I did this on was a 2019 um, Corvette Grand Sport. So. All I do is I put money in a policy first. That money is guaranteed to go up and compound tax-free, right? Yep. So I put money there, then I borrow against it and buy the car cash. And then all I do is I just treat my money like the banks. I pay myself back with interest. So I'm injecting money back into the policy for the cost of that car, right? Yep. So over, let's say, four or five years, whatever it ends up being, I'm putting all that back, which is getting all the money back that I spent for the car, plus interest, right? And then my money grew as well over that time frame, So the net injection into my policy is higher than what I actually put in. Mm -hmm. But I'm sorry, the growth is higher than the net injection. Because let's just say I put in over 100 grand. I pay myself back 100 grand, right? Yep. But let's say I bought the car for 70. That means 70 came out to use my net injections only 30,000 bucks, right? Yep. But let's say the policy over that time frame grew by 60 grand. It grew by 60. I only injected a net of 30. Mm. So I technically made money buying a car and now I own the car. Right. I could sell the car and let's say now it's worth 50. So I actually made 50 plus the net injection mm. difference over here. See what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. It's so much easier to see it um, like on a whiteboard or something like that. Or if someone sees an actual policy, how much it's growing. So our clients will show them like, look, you're going to inject this much in. It's going to grow by this much. You're using this much. Mm -hmm. Your net injection is that. Here's how much it grew by. You yeah. literally made money buying the car. So cool. And no one ever thinks of it like that because most people think when you buy a car, it's a depreciating asset, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the way I do it, I've bought a lot of cars and it's not a problem because I literally either get all the money back or I end up making money doing it. Do you do that on every car now? Every car. Every car. So I've so bought, you just bought a Porsche. Mm -hmm. You still have the Porsche, right? The, the 911? Two Porsches. Yeah. Yeah. But the not the new one that you bought for yourself, right? Yeah. So you did that through a policy mm -hmm. and you bought it in cash, leveraging the policy. Yep. Got it. And I just pay myself back what the payment would have been if I got a regular loan. And I just keep injecting premiums. So, dude, it's, it's the most efficient way to buy cars. For sure. You can either buy a car with cash 
but then you're giving up the ability for that cash to grow for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Opportunity cost, right? You could lease a car, but then you just have a rental, yeah. right? Or you could finance the car, but then you're just paying interest to the bank. I just figured out how to become my own bank. So I get that interest I used to give away and the money I put in just never stopped growing. Right. So I've bought, yeah. It really is brilliant, especially if we're buying a car. I didn't create this, guys. This is not something I created. Right. Yeah. This, is, uh, this has been around for a long time. The first life insurance policies were written in the 1700s. Really? Who are some of the big companies in the, in the life insurance whole life game? And like when you write policies, because you're an agent now, right? You're, a life, or you're a, an insurance agent. Um, is it always for like the same company or are there different companies that like you can go through? How does that work? Yeah. So there's different companies that work for this. Some companies don't, um, like not to get too much in the weeds, but there's a non-direct recognition company and a direct recognition company. Mm -hmm. What that means is if they are direct recognition, when you take a policy loan, it affects the growth. You don't want that. You want a non-direct recognition company. So you put money in, you borrow against it. It doesn't affect the growth. It just mm -hmm. keeps going up. So there's companies that are direct recognition. They don't really make sense a lot. Like Guardian mm -hmm. is one. We'll use them if we have to in like New York, because New York's a weird state. Mm -hmm. And a lot of companies just won't touch New York. Yeah. For obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. But the best companies we use are One America, uh, Lafayette Life, and Security Mutual. Okay. And those are all non-direct? Non-direct. They've been in business for over a hundred years. So super stable. Um, I think there's like even a stat that most, most businesses don't get past year five. Yeah. And then I think, I think it's like, it's not, yeah, I mean, it's a crazy stat. It's like 90%, nine out of 10, I think. These and then I think it's companies. another nine out of 10 of that nine out of 10. So of that one that made it another 90% of that one, I think fail in the next five years. So 10 years, every company's out of business. Pretty much. There's like 1%. These whole life it. companies in business for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. They're super stable. They're A-rated. So, and then another thing that we, we look at is they've all paid dividends every single year for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. And dividends just mean that the company's profitable. Yep. So they're mutually owned, meaning if you have a policy, if I have a policy, we mutually own the company. Mm -hmm. We're a part owner. So if you're an owner of the company, when they're profitable, they share those profits with you in dividends. So and they've paid and they haven't missed any for a hundred years. Over a hundred years. Wow. So we're talking about, dude, Great Depression, yep. World War One, World War Two, the Civil War, they paid dividends. Wow. So like they're not guaranteed to pay a dividend, but if they paid them in the Civil War, yeah, they're probably gonna keep paying them. Probably. Yeah. What is the average that you've seen? Now, I know you can't guarantee anything and we can't guarantee nothing, but you know how you say like the, the, the average is like three and a quarter. What's like the actual average, like that you've seen, like play out in the real world based on the dividends and everything. Like, do you think it comes out to like four and a quarter? Like you think it comes out any higher than three and a quarter? Yeah. The guarantee is three and a quarter. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be higher than that because the dividend has been paid every year for over a hundred years. Mm -hmm. The dividend is, uh, it's been the lowest it's ever been in history over the last few years because of how low rates were. Yeah. It kind of plays with that. I was saying earlier in the 80s, dividends were like 13, 14% because rates on mortgages back then were like 20%, mm -hmm. right? So with rates when they were like at 2%, dividends were very, very low. Um, I think the lowest I've seen a dividend is like 1.75. Wow. Um, last year it was like 2.6. So, once you add in the dividend, it, the policy grows around 5% a year tax free. Yep. And that's just now like if this next year, they'll probably be higher because of where rates have been. Mm -hmm. So who knows? They might be three, three and a half. So now you're looking at over 6% tax free growth for that year. Yeah. And once the dividend is declared, it can never be reversed. It is guaranteed to be there in cash value for the rest of your life. Wow. So cool. I mean, dude, the more that I talk to you, the more I'm like, I need to get a policy. This know? is what I was thinking a year and a half ago, bro, yeah, when we had I the know. first one. Well, I think it just, it, I think for just an, it, it's like what you said, you know, like 
I wouldn't even, it's actually probably a good question for you. Like on, on average, how long does it take from somebody who watches a piece of content of yours, gets on the phone with, let's just say you or somebody on your team and then actually pulls the trigger? Um, you have any idea? Like on the length of time, have you tracked that at all? No, probably a good thing to track. Mm -hmm. But how many are same dayers? Get them on that first phone call. They're like, I'm in. Um, if I take the call, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I mean, cause dude, when I used to take the calls, it was like, I'd get on a call with someone. I'm almost like a celebrity. They'd yeah. be like, is this, is this actually Mr. Burr? Yeah. Like, yeah, that's yeah, me. They're like, Oh my God. I didn't think I talked to you. So like yep. I could always close them pretty easily. Cause it's not really a sale. It's just me and you talking. I'm just explaining it. And then eventually you're just like, yeah, dude, I need to get one. Mm -hmm. How do I do it? And I would just set it up. I would say now with agents speaking to people, it's probably 70% yeah. are actually doing it that, that, that call. Cause the way I have it set up is they see me on like a short reel or something, or they see my YouTube channel talking about it and they have to go and watch a training video. It's an hour long where I actually show real numbers of like the car buying example, how you get the money back on a car, how you can pay debts off. I literally go and show everything real numbers. So then it just clicks more at the end of that call. They can then schedule or at the end of that uh, training. They can schedule the call then. Got it. But they have to watch that first. And if they don't, they can't get, they can't book a call. Exactly. Yeah. And you can kind of tell if someone like had it on and they weren't paying attention because mm -hmm. they'll ask questions that were clearly answered in the, the video. Sure. And when I used to take calls, I'd be like, you didn't really watch the video. So go back and rewatch it. Schedule. And then we'll talk. Yeah. Schedule. Cause Dude, if, if someone has not watched that video, it's going to be a two-hour phone call. Yeah. Like, how long have we been on the pod now for? Over an hour. Right. Hour 15, probably. Yeah. Right. And, and, it's like, and I could ask you 100 more questions if I really wanted to. Right. But, yeah. dude, if, if you watched the video before this mm -hmm. podcast, you really wouldn't have much questions for me. Yeah, which is why I didn't watch the video before the podcast, because <laughs> right. we're, we're not doing it for me. We're doing it for everybody else. You know what I mean? But if you yeah. did, dude, you'd just be like, hey, so you talked about this. Can you clarify that? Mm -hmm. uh, you said this. Can you clarify that? Yep. Okay, cool. Makes sense. Uh, how do I do it? Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it would go. Yeah. You know, so um, it's never a sale. It's just explaining it, making sure people understand how it works. Because, mm -hmm. dude, we don't, we don't want to be salesy. Mm -hmm. We set policies up for the benefit of the client. Mm -hmm. Again, our commissions are going way down. If I was in the life insurance industry to, like, make commissions, I would just sell regular whole life. I'd make sure. a hell of a lot more. Like. Full disclosure to everyone out there, I made $1.3 million in commissions last year. Mm -hmm. If I was selling regular whole life, I'd probably have made $10 million. Yeah. For sure, dude. Well, I just had a guy on my podcast um, a week, maybe two weeks ago. And uh, you, you might know him. His name's Hayden Hill. Doesn't sound familiar. Okay. He lives, he lives out here. Him and his wife just bought a house up north. Um, they actually just got acquired. So they built, so I've known Hayden actually since I got into Vima. Okay. So if you remember Vima, mm -hmm. right? Network marketing. Um, so he was in Vima when I was in Vima. And, uh, you know, when, when Vima got shut down, you know, everybody went and did their own thing. Morton went over here. Brad Alcazin went over there, you know. Um, so Hayden got into, I think he did a couple things and then he in, eventually landed in insurance. I, of course, landed in real estate. Um, and anyways, yeah, he, he built this company and they just got acquired. Wow. Like not too long ago for, I, and he didn't tell me, I don't think he's allowed to. Um, but I mean, just based on what I know, like they did well and he's oh, young, yeah. dude. He's like my age. He's yeah, I think he's literally 29. Wow. And he already got a, he already built a, and he sold the infinite banking stuff, but they also sold other stuff too. So they sold yeah. annuities, they <laughs> sold regular term, they sold pretty much everything. Um, but he was super familiar with infinite banking. We didn't do a deep dive into it, but I did brush on it a little bit when I had him on the pod. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Cause I mean, Patrick, Bed David just sold for like a quarter of a bill. Wow. Like you knew that Yep. he built that insurance company and I don't think he was allowed to say either, but I don't think he cares. Yeah. That's the thing, man. It's like I, a lot of people tell me, dude, why don't you start doing other stuff? Yeah. Like instead of just uh, infinite banking, mm -hmm. do like the term, do all these things. I'm like, because I don't believe in it. Like I believe in infinite banking because I was doing it before I was ever an agent. Mm -hmm. I was just, this is working so much for me. I just need to share it with other people. Mm -hmm. And the more I shared it, the more I started making, I was like, 
let me just keep sharing this with people. Right. So I don't know. Part of me, but again, it all goes back to like, how much more do you really freaking need? Yeah. yeah. Like seriously, for sure. Like give me a couple mil a year, keep most of it. Cause I don't pay a bunch in taxes. I don't have a bunch of employees get to spend a ton of time with my family work, maybe three hours a day. I'm good with that. For sure. Cause if you do that for a long enough period of time, you're good. Oh yeah. Like you're good. Yeah. You and know. then if I die tomorrow, family's yeah, good. Family's good. So <laughs> you know? it's like, you got nothing to worry about. Helps me sleep at night, man. Yeah. Just sure. knowing that my family's taken care of, mm-hmm. you know? And then my parents, like, it's really cool what I've been able to do for my parents. I got policies on them mm-hmm. and it's on their lives. Mm-hmm. I fund it from my family trust. So the trust owns the policy. This is like a ninja move. So the, the trust owns the policy since the trust owns it. If I pay those premiums, that's an expense on the trust. Mm. So that's, it doesn't need to be taxed. So I'm literally not getting taxed on that money. Then it's going into a policy to, for them to grow tax-free. Okay. Yep. So then I just take the cash value and pay them retirement income. And that retirement income, because again, the policy is always growing. The retirement income keeps growing. Mm. So the longer they live, the more they're getting from the trust, not me, from the family trust. When they die, my parents are going to die someday, hopefully a long time from now. When they die, that trust gets made whole, pays off everything I paid them, all those loans. And then the death benefit, whatever's remaining, goes to the trust. So my trust gets bigger. Mm -hmm. I just, again, take that money that's in the trust and buy more policies on me my daughters, my wife. So it was an easy sale for my parents because they had to agree to it. Yep. I'm like, guys, I'm just going to pay you for the rest of your lives, right. retirement income, help you retire. When you die, your death benefit's going to help our family get wealthier by buying more policies. Mm-hmm. Are you guys okay with that? They're like, yeah. They're like, yeah, why wouldn't we? <laughs> You're not going to kill us, right? I'm right. like, I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. And so in that scenario, you're not ever, you don't actually intend on even paying, paying it back. You just intend on the ever. death benefit, mm-hmm. right? Like the loans that you're taking against the policy to pay your parents, right? Like you actually don't intend on paying it back. Nope. Yeah. Cause all I do is I've got money coming into my trust all the time. Yep. Okay. So I have an automatic payment set up which is a 12th of whatever that cash value is that year, right? So let's just use easy math. Let's say the cash value is 12 grand. Mm -hmm. My mom and dad are getting a thousand each that year, okay? Automatic payment from my trust bank account. What I do as soon as I fund that policy and let's say the cash value was 12 grand, I take it and immediately deploy it to make me more than what I'm paying them. Mm. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I'm making money with the money. I'm paying them a little bit throughout the year. When they die, the loans are paid off with the death benefit. The surplus goes to the trust to buy more policies to grow tax-free. Wow. And I was never taxed on it one time. So cool. Yeah, it really is cool. I know you said you don't believe in it, um, but is there a, a situation, in your opinion, where somebody would buy term or they would get like one of these other types of policies? Like, is there, is there a time or a place where you'd be like, you know what? It's actually not a bad idea. Like, you should go get a a term policy or you should go do this or you should go do that or in your opinion, does it really never? Um, it depends. I mean, for some people it does make sense because this is statistically Americans save less than 5%. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, you're taxed. So that's the biggest eroder of wealth. And then before you even have your money, you're paying everybody else, your mortgage, your car payments, all these things that again, you're paying interest to other people. Mm Mm-hmm. So all that is gone, you're left with 5% of what you made. So if you make a dollar, you're left with five cents. Those people like really can't afford to put in enough money for it to make sense. Remember how we said for you it was $290 a month? Yeah. If you can't afford to put in at least $290 a month, this won't work, right? So in that sense, those people probably should get term and have it be convertible. Yeah. Meaning they get term now to protect their life. If they, God forbid, die, so many people would pass away without any kind of insurance, which makes no sense. Like we insure our houses. We have to, we insure our cars. There's no guarantee our house is going to burn down. There's no guarantee we're going to wreck our car. We insure our phones, right? 
There's no guarantee we're going to drop the phone. Yeah. I drop mine all the time. But we don't insure our life. We don't insure our life. We're guaranteed to die. Maybe not with technology. No, I'm just playing around. I mean, that's that's another. Yeah. <laughs> dude, I'm reading this book right now. The Coming Wave. Yeah, dude. We can download like, dude, you look at what they're doing, man. I mean, we'll see. We'll see in it's, our lifetime if we can't take your brain, your thoughts, your feelings, your, your everything and, and just upload it to a new body. <laughs> freaking crazy dude can you imagine to think that that might be possible well elon's already i think they're on their second um Neuralink, right they've implanted i think two in two humans they want to be at 10 by the end of the year so they'll have, there'll be 10 humans on planet earth in 2024 it's just wild dude it's freaking wild by december with Neuralink implanted in their brain it's freaking wild you know what's insane to me about this is like, so I've got two girls, right? Uh -huh. I really want a boy. I want one really bad. <laughs> yeah. Because like, I, th I think a legacy a lot. That's why I do everything I do with the life insurance stuff. I'm building a legacy. Mm -hmm. That's why I've got the trust in place, the succession plan to make sure that my family cannot squander all this money that I'm working so hard to generate and build. And you know what I mean? Yep. So I want my legacy to live on. Part of that's the last name. Mm. Like- so I think if I don't have a boy, I'm going to put like in the trust <laughs> that like the husband has to take the last right. name of Burr. He has to change his last name. Right. Yeah. But dude, there's already technology where you can choose the sex. Wow. So do you know Greg Hurling? Mm, no. So owns Horizon Trust. Mm -hmm. um, good buddy of mine. Great dude. They did that with uh, their kid because she was getting a little older. He's 44 and they had one shot. And he wanted a little girl. So you can do it to where they basically take all the eggs, they take sperms, and they're like making sure they're healthy. That's one thing. And you've got the male sperm. They can really? basically implant it, but then it's kind of invasive to the woman because then they have to like put it back up there. Got it. And everything. Yeah. Um, so I told my wife, I'm like, I think it's about 10 grand. Mm -hmm. When we had our last daughter, she made me pay 10 grand to save the umbilical cord. Yeah. Because there's different things you can do with, um, uh, I guess there's not plasma, but. Um, like a different type of blood cell or something? Yeah, or where, like like, a, where it, can, it can like help us or help uh -huh. her if she ever gets sick. Got it. So they stored it in like an, uh, a third party facility. It was 10 grand. And I'm like, well, I paid 10 grand for that. <laughs> can I pay 10 grand to make sure we got a boy? <laughs> right. Is she, what did she say? She was like, no, <laughs> we're not doing that. And I'm like. <laughs> yeah. All right. But she dude, wants it to be, yeah. She wants it to be all like natural. Yeah. It is it. what it is. But yeah. dude, it's getting to the point where you could start saying, like, mm -hmm. I want my kid to be 6'3. Yeah. I want my kid to have that blue day eyes. will come. Mm -hmm. Crazy, bro. Crazy. Yeah. The world, we could go on a friggin', I'd have to go to the bathroom a couple times, but we could go like deep in the rabbit hole. Maybe one day we should. We should just sit down and just make a bunch of viral clips. Like, if we just talk for two hours about everything, we could probably get a lot of the clips to go viral. You know what we should do? We should take some shrooms right when we start the show. <laughs> and then by yes. about 30 minutes yeah. in, an hour in, uh -huh. it'll be getting real viral clips. Have you done um, a microdosing ever? Yeah. Okay. I've yeah. never done microdosing. I did regular mushrooms a long time ago, like way too much of them, you know, and I had like a bad trip. Um, but I really have been wanting to try microdose. It's so I bought, I bought, just to clarify. Because why not? <laughs> I actually buy, I have them in my house, like in a capsule form, like microdose. And we're, I haven't we're, taken we're going it to his house. After I'm a this. little, I'm a little, I'm just a little on edge still. Every weekend, Mosey's like, you want to do it? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not mm. sure. I'm just not. I, I got to really be in the right frame of mind, I think. For microdosing, I don't really think so. Because uh -huh. if you microdose, it just kind of makes everything a little more enhanced. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, best way I could describe it is you have an iphone right yeah you know when you have the filters mm -hmm. and there's the vivid mode mm -hmm. how everything has kind of a hue over it it's kind of how everything just kind of looks more vivid wow and like you just earn like a heightened mood um i've microdosed several times and uh it's finding that happy medium because you can definitely take too much and then you start freaking people's do faces you do are melting and the capsules or do you do like the chocolate capsules capsules how many milligrams is a microdose? Because I got, we got, we ordered, two. here's why, to be honest with you, I haven't done it yet. Because I, I just need to do more research. Because like when you order, like I order from this guy, I think Troy Casey was on the podcast. It was like his Certified connection. health nut. Shout out, yeah. Troy. 
certified health net, really cool dude, love Troy, right? So I used, I went through like his guy, he recommended. And, um, you know, when you go on their website, you like, it's like you're paying for like consulting because you can't like legally pay right. for mushrooms. So you, you're paying for like consulting, consulting fee. And then when, and then you pick like mild, medium or strong, right? And um, so I think we did, I did like one mild, one medium. But then when they, and then they tell you, I think at some point they're like 250 milligrams or like 350 milligrams. And then when you get the capsules, it doesn't say which one's which. <laughs> so like I told Moshe, I'm like, send him an email. Like, I want to know, like, I need to know, you know, it's just like one's pink and the other one's like yellow. And I'm like, so, so now I'm a little, I'm scared. I just, I don't want to do it. Cause I'm like, I'm like, okay, well, how much is 250 milligrams? Like, is that a lot? Is that a little bit? Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know what to think anymore. Uh, I mean, I'm not an expert at this, so don't like, <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, we went a whole different direction we, here. We'd probably want to consult with uh, Troy on this. Yeah, yeah. But um, I think anything I've ever done is like, um, I go off of, it's like 0. 0.2. Okay. So I think that'd be like 200 milligrams. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you're at 250, it's like 0. 0.25. Yeah. You should be fine. Okay. Like, I think it's when you start taking like maybe four or five of them bad boys. Mm -hmm. People's, yeah, people's faces are going to start melting. No longer micro dose. Yeah. Then you're, yeah. then you've got your head up to a speaker so, at the uh, office. A regular dose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> doof, doof, right. Doof, doof. Yeah. What's gotten into oh, him man. today? It's so funny, dude. Well, dude, I appreciate you coming on again, bro. I know we talked, about, I really wanted to though, this podcast went exactly how I wanted it to go. I wanted to make a podcast jam packed, clearful of just infinite banking, whole life, how to do it, how to structure it, what to do. Like, cause I wanted to, to make a video that lived where we could point people to and say, hey, here's everything you need to know, mm -hmm. right? So we accomplished that today. I really believe we got right to the chase. We went, uh, did a deep dive. Um, so if anybody stayed to the very end, cause we got, believe it or not, dude, we've been here for like an hour and a half almost. Yeah. If anybody stayed to the very end, where can people find you if they want to, uh, to get a policy or they just want to ask you a question? Yes, yeah, so you guys can find me anywhere on social media. It's at Mr. Underscore Burr. So it's spelled just like the shirt. If you're listening to this, it'd be B with four R's. So Mr. Underscore B with four R's. Uh, you can find me anywhere. Um, one thing I want to touch on real quick, we, we covered a lot. Yeah. And usually when that happens, people are confused for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. If you guys just dumb this down, all infinite banking is, is simply making a spread on money. That's it. You're just borrowing from an asset that's guaranteed to grow. You're borrowing for an interest rate. You just got to go take it and make more than that interest rate. It's about 5%. So if you know how to make more than 5%, you're just keeping a spread on money mm -hmm. by using an asset that never stops growing mm -hmm. and that you have unhindered control on. You can make a payment back or you could not. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. So if, if you guys are watching this and you might be a little confused, just think of it as, I'm borrowing against an asset that's guaranteed to grow and I'm just making a spread on what they charge me. They charge me 5%. If I go and make 10, I'm keeping a 5% spread on the money that's guaranteed to grow at the same time. Mm. That's yeah. it. Beautiful. I love it. I appreciate you being here. So they can find you, Mr. Burr. I'll link all your stuff down below, man. And um, so if you're still watching, if you're on YouTube, Spotify, anywhere, wherever you're at, you know, down below, Devin Burr, all of his information is going to be there. Click his profile. Go check him out. Go follow him. Hit him up. And uh, dude, when we do round three, bro, I'm going to have a minimum of one policy, if not multiple. So because this is round two, we've done two podcasts. We're going to do a third, right? Because we have to, you know, and uh, when we do, you mark my words right now. Everybody can just hold me to it. I'm going to have multiple policies by the time we do that. On the third, we should have like a whiteboard. Dude, that would be dope. Because that would make it, most people are visual learners. Mm -hmm. So if you see it, it makes a lot more sense. At least that's how I am. Yeah. Um, I had to really see it for the concept to really make sense um, on a granular level. So if we can get a whiteboard, um, I know you've got one in the office, right? Where yeah, you can oh, write yeah. on it and erase it and all that stuff. I could even put what, what at one point I'm going to put like a TV here that like is like a smart TV. Perfect. Like the drawing TV. Perfect. Yeah. That would be really good because then we could pull up like one of your policies. Yep. We could show the cash value, show how you're moving it because our team helps everyone mm -hmm. use the policy. Like if you are learning how to golf and you buy the best clubs there are, yeah. if you have no idea how to swing them, what, what good was it? You need to hire a golf and, uh, coach. You'd be better yeah. off having really crappy clubs and mastering your swing. Mm -hmm. 
we're giving you the best clubs, the best financial product, a foundational financial product. But if you have no idea how to use it, it's, it's just a glorified savings account. Yeah. So we show all of our clients how to use the policy, how to go buy cars, how to pay off debt, how to put it into an investment to make you more. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't tell you the investment because we don't want that smoke, right? Yeah, yeah. But if you have an investment, we'll show you how it's going to flow. So with yours, we'll show you how to put it into your businesses, how to make money cool. with it. And we could show it on a whiteboard. And it would just be more visual so people would be able to grasp it a little bit, I think. Okay, round three. There you go. Like the video, comment down below if you want round three. Maybe we'll do it even sooner than we initially planned. Awesome. down. Devin, I appreciate you being here, bro. If you're still watching to the very end, thank you so much. Subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video, comment down below, go follow Devin, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next episode.